You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. Do you think parental authority is under attack in our culture? How is this impacting the role of the family in society? Join us to hear from Soren and Ever Johnson, founders of Trinity House Community, as they discuss parental authority and the family under fire. Parental authority is being challenged because we're letting it be challenged. Today's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer at the Diocese of Arlington. Let's jump right in. Soren and Ever, thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks so for having us. We're going to have a conversation about families, which is very appropriate. It's been a big topic, obviously, in the news with regard to whether it's education or what a family looks like, all these kinds of things. And you all have a, a beautiful ministry that's really oriented to to families and to marriage. And so I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about kind of some of the external threats to the family and then even, you know, where maybe there's some some internal threats. Uh, we see, you know, the rights of parents have been under attack a good bit, and we've seen this played out in sc- everything where from school board meetings to social media and, and all the rest. So um, when you look at the landscape of, you know, parents' rights and, you know, what is out there that's supporting and hurting the family, how do you see as, like, we got to where we are? If you are to kind of lay, lay out the big picture, obviously that's a that, question could take you know volumes to address but when you look at it in the big picture what do you think um i think it's a really easy question good and um (laughs) i would say aristotle gave a a succinct answer to it a long time ago and he said nature abhors a vacuum Mm. and that's the answer and it's probably not the most popular answer to give yeah But I think a lot of times we as Christians and Christian parents and the church spend a little too much time um, worrying about and being upset about what's coming at us from the culture and not looking at the fact that if we had maybe done a better job of forming our children, they wouldn't be falling so easily to so many of the messages that they're Mm. getting from our culture. So I, I, I really think that parental authority is being challenged because we're letting it be challenged. Mm. A lot of uh, Christian parents are um, participating a little bit too much in our consumerist materialist culture. And yes, they talk to their kids about their beliefs and their values, but they don't proactively create an invigorating, immersive experience of Christian community and culture for their children to inhabit. Mm. They they themselves and they, they allow their children to largely inhabit our secular materialist culture, spend a lot of time in the busyness and distraction and entertainment parts of our culture, and um, not enough time proactively creating a Christian community and culture for their family within their home, within their neighborhood, within their community. So it, to me, it's no wonder that if you allow your children to spend a lot of time in that culture, and I'm not saying we should bunker down and, and hide ourselves from right. the people who need us most at all. I'm just saying, you know, when we stream Netflix three or four nights a week, instead of spending our time creating that uh, beautiful, rich Catholic culture in our homes, it's no wonder that our kids fall to those messages. So. Christian parents need to take their responsibility more seriously and prioritize their time in a way that allows their family to experience the richness of everything the faith and the practice of the faith in the home has to offer. Yeah, there's the the famous quotes, um, <clears throat> show me your friends, I'll show you your future. It's like, sh- show me how you spend your time and I'll show you what you care about. Exactly. It's like that that kind exactly. of idea. Yeah. I think for a lot of parents, they don't really know where to start. You know, maybe they weren't raised. It can become, yeah, exactly. become a spiral of problems where they weren't raised in the faith real devoutly, or maybe it was like I call it an appendage of life where it's just kind of like yes. this, I'm, I'm, I'm this person and I'm also a Catholic. Was well, kind of like, I'm also a fisherman or I'm also a, you know, you know, right. uh, somebody who plays chess or something. It's like, it's, it's a thing that I do. It's not who I am. Well, then how does that person then go and raise children in the faith and for the faith and all those kinds yeah. of things? Yes. So Soren, what would you say is kind of a starting point for, for, for parents who, who don't know where to start? What is a good way to use that time wisely so that they can maybe partition things differently? Um, well, we, Ever and I have really um, 
been struck by just a deeper reflection on how we each bear the image and likeness of God, right? We all are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. But when you drill down and go, well, what does that mean? We find that the image of God is the image of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. The family is a communion of persons. It's the Imago Dei, it's the Imago Trinitatis. And so the family reflects images, um, the interior life, the inner life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an icon of God's life of love. So Ever and I, as we really try to um, inspire and equip families, we just keep going back and back and back to the Holy Trinity um, to encourage parents to, um, as John Paul II said, become what you are. Uh, John Paul II also said the future of humanity passes by way of the family. And if the family is fundamentally a loving community of, a communion of persons um, whose love can reflect the inner life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's where we can begin. We yeah. can begin with these expressions of daily love in the family, and there's so many levels to that, but that's... Yeah. The, the beginning point. Yeah, that daily commitment, that daily life um, is kind of like a, it's, it's a worldview that permeates everything that you do. And we talk about the domestic church, and this is a phrase that, you know, if you haven't heard it before, it's kind of confusing because we always think of church as a thing that we go to yes. rather than a, a thing that we can actually incorporate at home as well. And that's not to diminish the mass that can't be replicated or the sacraments that we receive at, at, at church. Um, but there is a, a role for the domestic church. Ever For those who haven't heard that before, what is the domestic church and how should that play a role in our life? I think when you f first hear it, it's a little bit of a confusing phrase, as you say. But if you think, um, first think, what is the church? Well, the church is the union of God and man. It's the body of Christ. It's the way that God gives out his grace into the world through the sacraments. Then if the family and the Christian family is meant to be an image of God, then the Christian family in, in their home is like God in the church in a way. Um, dispensing the grace of God's life into their neighborhood. Mm. So um, in that sense, it's just a very, um, <clears throat> very clear uh, sort of connection between uh, the, the Christian home as a little church and the church. Uh, the family is the image of the Trinity. They live in self-giving love, caring for each other, caring for their neighbors, mm -hmm. and uh, giving life and um, being creative and bringing good to their neighborhood. Yeah, and it's where we first learn the faith. I mean, it, that's, you know, exactly. it's, it's the bedrock of that for most people, you know. It, right, and if you think of the church as um, catechizing people, um, you know, that happens, of course, in CCD, but at home, the parents are the first educators of their children in the faith, and so yeah. in, in that sense, the, the parents are catechists. The parents are dispensers of sacramental life in a sense, not in a strict sense, as in yeah. the church, but they are dispensing God's grace when they yeah. when they participate in a life of self-giving. They're, they're giving the love that people need to be like God to, to give your life for others. So. Well, anytime you take a little kid to church, you, you realize the effect on the kid is clearly invisible <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. they're not listening like you want them to. And they're not taking it. You could ask, you know, even a 10-year-old going go from church, what did Father say during the homily? Yes. They can't replicate sure. a single word for the homily. What was the gospel? Oh, I don't remember. You know, I'm sure a lot of adults find themselves in the same position. But so in the home, you are the first teacher. And we don't mean that just in kind of some philosophical sense. Literally, practically, mm -hmm. they're first experiencing the idea of God from you. They're yes. first experiencing any sense of church, right. community, uh, first experience with the scriptures, all of that kind right. of the saints, the communion of the saints, that all happens because you're teaching them at home. Yes. And it's almost like as they go to, to, to mass and, you know, experience the, you know, eventually the sacraments, that's almost like the supplement that becomes the primary meal, <laughs> yes. you know, but yeah. we're feeding them initially everything that they, yeah. they're going to have until they start receiving those those gifts, those, those really and extraordinary Going back gifts. to what we were saying in the first question, <clears throat> it's not so much teaching them by talking to them. It's a model. You model to them self-giving love and interpersonal communion. Yeah. You create a com Christian culture in your home that they inhabit and they partake of that's very primal and visceral. Mm -hmm. It's not just 
you know, we act like every other American family and watch screens all the time and use our home as a place to dump our stuff when we're running back and forth to sports practice. (laughs) No, your home is a church. It's beautifully outfitted. It's uh, gorgeously enriched with culture and beautiful art and music. And you live out a life of self-giving within that context of caring for people's needs for basic needs for food and shelter to higher needs for beauty and you are modeling the life of God and modeling heaven within your home and a lot of people rely way too much on talking and reading books and teaching ideas but children as you're saying they don't respond to that they are not listening to the father they're looking at the stained glass they're looking at the vastness of the space you know above them and they're experiencing the warmth of the people around them, but it's all very primal. It's mm-hmm. it's not an idea. It's a it's a model. It's a thing that they're inhabiting. And this domestic church, this home that you're you're raising your kids in, it's where they become equipped and introduced to maybe even some of the 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 challenges and the good things of the outside world. But I think of one you mentioned the image and likeness of God. It just made me think of the debate about transgenderism yeah. and gender ideology. Bishop Burbage issued a catechesis on this because he heard so many parents say. This is a problem. We're seeing this force down our kids' throats in our schools. We can't stand this. But we also don't really know exactly how to describe what it is we believe. We need some help here. Yeah. And so he, he heard that call, and he issued that catechesis that he, he drafted with a, a team of real experts um, to help equip parents so they can go to those school board meetings that I mentioned and these different things to, to advocate for themselves but really for their children so that yes. their children are taught – what is um, good and what's true. And a lot of the challenge obviously is that teachers and children and so on are being forced to say what's not true. That's a really insidious thing to force someone to lie or to attempt to force someone to lie. Um, so talk, talk a little bit, of, if you don't mind, about how this kind of breakdown of the, the domestic church can lead to these problems where they're not equipped to go out, but how then that's also the answer Right. I mean, that, mm-hmm. that's what you're, you know, um, ever was kind of getting. At. Sure. Yeah. The, the breakdown, you know, back to that great John Paul II quote, you know, the future of humanity passes by way of the family. Uh, you know, we we're, we're very quick to locate areas of breakdown in our culture, maybe in politics, maybe in Silicon Valley, maybe in Hollywood. But we got to keep going upstream, upstream to the family, the fundamental cell of society, as John Paul II has said. As Pope Francis, as, the, as we can read in the Catechism, so the family is really um, the place where parents are called to be their prime, the primary educators of their children, uh, forming their children. That's that's where the buck stops, right mm-hmm. there with the parents. Um, the three of us, when we, uh, you know, the baptisms of our children, we answered a, a question from the priest. Uh, do you understand what you're what you are doing? You know, um, you are promising to raise and train your children in the faith, and we said we do. Um, so we live out that baptismal promise when we take our role as parents seriously. As ever said, uh, nature abhorring a vacuum. We're seeing so many yeah. breakdowns in our society of you know an atrophy of civil society, and then. <clears throat> aspects of the federal government possibly yeah. stepping in. So yeah. I think parents can really um, take great hope, great encouragement, and just uh, a renewed understanding of their role as the primary educator. Yeah, and we've really seen a rebellion against that lie, too, and that's mm-hmm. that's made a lot of kind of, you know, yeah. political headway. And, you know, so we're seeing, I think, things moving in the right direction. I'm not sure that everyone's as catechized as they probably need to be. But, you know, I, I my wife and I teach some of the Conference for the Engage courses. And a lot of the questions that you get from couples, for me, it boils down to um, be humble, be intentional, and, and just work hard at it. Like, if you do those things, you're going to figure it out. Yeah. You're not going to have all the answers. You're not mm-hmm. going to leave the Conference for the Engage you know, having all the answers. We're 11 years married. We still don't have all the answers. And at 51 years, we're not going to have right. all the answers. <laughs> but it's like, do you have those qualities? Right. It's going to work out. And mm-hmm. I would I would encourage parents that same way, that 
you're not equipped now, and by the way, you won't. They'll be well into right. adulthood. You're still not equipped. Like exactly. that's the reality <laughs> yeah. of the challenge in front of us. But just be humble about it. Learn what you can. Be intentional about learning those things, and just work hard mm -hmm. at at loving your kids and teaching them whatever you can. And what they need to absorb, they'll absorb with God's grace. And mm -hmm. what you know, your, whatever mistakes you make, hopefully that uh, that bounces off them, and, <laughs> yeah. and they don't soak that in as much. But you know, when you're dealing with issues like transgenders, which is such a fundamental, you know, lie, the yes. kids are being kind of bullied into it, believing it or acknowledging mm -hmm. it or whatever. Like we've got some major battles ahead of us, and and you know, being equipping. You know, part of the domestic church is you want to inspire kids and you want them to, you know, experience the joy sure. of faith. And we don't want it to make it like a barracks, you know, where we're just equipping them for this war out there. Sure. But right. we have to do both. I mean, because mm -hmm. that's that's yep. the reality of the spiritual life is there are days where you just feel like you're basking in the greatness of God and, mm -hmm. and you know, frolicking through fields of green. And then other days where it's more like there's clouds overhead and the storm's coming and we have to, you know, sharpen our swords and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But, but doing both and balancing those, I think, is, mm -hmm. is important for kids. You mentioned a, a document that I, I think most probably haven't dug too deeply into, uh, Familiaris Consortium. Talk about what that document is. Um, you know, people can Google and find it, but you know, John Paul II wrote it. But give us kind of the, the big picture view of what is that document? Why should people dig into it? Sure. Um, well, in 1980, there was a synod on the family, uh, on the, the role of the Christian family in the modern world. It was one of uh, John Paul II's first synods as pope, and he uh, personally attended almost all of the sessions. Apparently, he um, was in there taking notes constantly, uh, very engaged in the synod. And so this document, which will uh, be 40 years old this month uh, in November, is really kind of— um, I've heard that it's one of John Paul. It was one of John Paul II's favorites uh, mm. of his entire teaching of his um, pontificate, which is a pretty deep yeah, bench. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> very deep. to say yeah. that's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you think about the big picture context, it's amazing. Uh, you're you're in the you're in the Cold War, you're in the Solidarity Movement. Uh, John Paul II's own. Um, experience of the family as kind of a pocket of freedom surrounded by totalitarianism and he looks around and he sees the divorce culture and the the wreckage of the sexual revolution 10 12 mm -hmm. years on and he uh sees in this document which is you know about a two-hour read and it's it's not over people's heads it's it's a great encouraging mm -hmm. um kind of battle cry a, a, a blueprint for the family great document to uh to read he just lays out uh what what the family is intended to be uh and he really begins it with that uh, look at the trinity a uh, communion of persons and uh so it's a beautiful document that was addressing things that seemed pretty bad at the time you you could say <laughs> things are a lot worse now again downstream we've seen just a kind of cascading uh, series of challenges for the family uh, year after yeah. year. Yeah. Could I read us a quote from the document that I think is so relevant? Oh, I suppose you can. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> this just this just jumped out at me um, because it and it really speaks to your question about if parents don't know what to do to form their children in the home. What practically speaking could you offer yeah. them? Um, this is in the part about family prayer. He says. Only by praying together with their children can a father and mother, exercising their royal priesthood, penetrate the innermost depths of their children's hearts and leave an impression that the future events in their lives will not be able to efface. Mm. And what, I, what jumped out at me here is how often we're tempted to rely on our own words, ideas, and strategies and ways of teaching mm. our children but in fact, in prayer, especially in the liturgy of the hours where the church gives you words that are time tested mm -hmm. to imprint your children with, you don't have to recreate that wheel. We use the Magnificat to pray morning prayer with our children. And the, the pattern, the beauty of the scriptures, the psalms, the hymns, they love to sing the hymns. And of course, there is time, of course, for your own, you know, added in prayer mm -hmm. and the intercessory prayer part. Um, I think for parents who don't know what to do or where to start, don't worry too much about what 
how you're going to teach your children. Let the Word of God teach your children. Mm, that's a great point. And the Magnificat is, is perfect because you don't just have to open the Bible and go to anything and not, not be sure what you're doing. Yeah, that like it's, Russian roulette of Scripture doesn't always work. Yeah. Right, right. The <laughs> you Magnificat and you're like, is exactly I'm not sure if that was God's will or yeah. just my bad, right. <laughs> my fat thumb finding the wrong. <laughs> exactly. But the Magnificat is perfectly calibrated to that day, to that yep. season. It includes all the different parts of Scripture. It includes singing and all you have to do is lead it and give your children different parts in it. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of the words will, will sink in and the future events in our lives will not be able to efface the working of God's word. Yeah. And it can so. almost sound like a spiritual truism to say start with prayer. But it really is. It's, it is yeah. the easiest. Because even if easiest. you don't know yeah. how to pray the Our Father, which very few people don't know how to do that, just start with, you know, th- teaching your kids gratitude. What do we want to thank God for mm. today? Yes. What do yeah. we want God's help with? That is a starting point. And you can Google every prayer you want to pray and structure yes. it however you want as you go. But I, I, I agree with you. I think that's a very strong point that children seeing you pray also demonstrates that it's, this is authentic. If yeah. it's just teachings yes. and dictates and what to do yeah. and not yes. to do and those kinds of things, it becomes very legalistic. And I yes. think there's phases of the church in the last hundred years or whatever where that was kind of the primary way people assumed the faith, so to speak, was these are the rules, follow the rules. Yeah. When yeah. it's really far richer than that, but if you want to make it easier on yourself, that's what you do, but it's not yes. effective. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it doesn't evangelize and it, it doesn't come across as sincere. And in an age of social media, Especially sincerity is very obvious to people. Sure. People yeah. look at Instagram and they see insincerity constantly. Yeah. But why does like a Father Mike Schmitz just explode on social media, right? Mm-hmm. Bishop yeah. Burbage's Twitter account has done extremely well, and it's because he doesn't use it to push what people might see as propaganda. It's a spiritual reflection. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even include like a URL to the website, despite the fact that I ask him to. Sometimes. <laughs> but he's right. But he's right not to because it would it would create for some this sense of oh, he does want something out of me. This is mm. part of a strategy. There's no strategy yeah. here. Yeah. He prays and he tweets, like mm. a reflection on right. the gospel of that day. It's that simple. But I think people who are very authentic, Bishop Barron obviously being another example of that. Um, that authenticity matters when you pray with your kids and have just an a, a true realistic prayer life yeah. that your kids are able to observe from time to time. Yes. I think there's something to that that, is, that stops them in their tracks and yeah. makes them realize... Well, if I want to be like dad, especially when they're real little, it's easy to yeah. do that. Because you don't have to be a good dad, lucky for me, <laughs> for them to want to be like you. But they'll look at it and be like, if I want to be like that, that's what I need to do. And they'll mm-hmm. do that themselves. Right. Like with our kids and our, our, you know, nighttime prayers and stuff, we've started that before we do our more kind of structured prayer. I'll say, what was something that went well today that you want to thank God for? Yeah. What's something that you want his help with? And that brings out some great stories, and you get little insights to those little brains that are more complicated than we like to admit. Mm -hmm. But just building a little piece on here and there. Again, if you're Mm -hmm. intentional, you'll Mm -hmm. figure it out as you go. Just keep working hard. What are some things that you all have done with your family that you feel like, okay, this was kind of like a custom fit, but it it worked for us. Yeah. What would you say are some of those stories? Well, I I think, um, you know, family meals are uh, just uh, kind of the, the basic bedrock I think mm-hmm. of a lot of our family culture I yeah. think uh, when you look at what's going on with meals in our country uh, fewer and fewer families are sitting down together and you know two more than once twice a week and having dinner together um, we read that the average American uh, dinner is 11 minutes you know wow um, that's scary you know, you know but um I think so that's one area that I think Ever and I have tried to invest some time and love into is uh, you know trying to get a nice meal on the table and then be intentional in leading in conversation kind of like you just said about w- w- what was a great thing that happened today or mm-hmm. what wasn't so great you know it doesn't take much and the the table will just explode in conversation yeah uh, we got to do a better job of telling stories, of lingering at the table, of weaving in today's news events mm-hmm. with our faith. Yeah. Uh, you can do kind of just a little catechesis on the fly right there yeah. as parents, you know, with today's news or what happened on the bus. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, going back to the Trinity, you know, what's happening in the life of God is there's this constant intercommunion of the three persons. Uh, a self-gift, a generosity, a self-sacrifice, 
a constant love, a constant going out. Um, you know, our family prayer times, dinner times um, one thing that's can be been a, really, a glimpse of that. Yeah. Well, one thing that's been really fruitful for us is because we have five kids, and when they were little, I was terrified of um, waking up in the morning to get them ready for school and not having everything ready because I having chaos in the morning sounds like the worst thing to me. So we, and I'm from a family of 12 kids, we all often had chaos in the morning. So we were obsessed in many of the early years with lining everything up perfectly in the evening before we went to bed Yeah. so that the morning would be really peaceful because not being able to find your shoes when the bus is waiting for you is a <laughs> terrible experience. Yeah. But what it resulted in was um, an extra 10 minutes in the morning where everyone was together and we were like, hey, Magnificat, let's, let's do this morning prayer. Let's sing. Let's start off the day with scripture. And it just snowballed into like a major family tradition where the kids get on the bus having just sung some beautiful traditional hymn and they love it and they each have their part and they you know pray for whatever their intentions are for the day and that's you know just a beautiful way of yeah. let, letting mm-hmm. god especially you know the singing i love the singing that's not for every family but I think the Holy Spirit really gets in there when they open their hearts in that way. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the evening family rosary. I mean, yeah, that's just so calming and relaxing because it's repetitive and it, you know, allows you to meditate on the mysteries. And especially for little kids, they only have to learn a couple prayers and they're yeah, ready to right. go. They're up there with yeah. the adults praying the rosary and they, and can they feel can very even proud lead of that. a decade. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's funny how as you grow as a family, you kind of adapt certain things in. So like our son is getting ready for his first confession in, in a year. So we're starting now kind of doing some catechesis with him and teaching him things. And so one thing we decided was before night prayer, we're going to do an examination of conscience just privately in your head. I explained to them what that means, what you want to think about, tell God you're sorry for things, that kind of stuff. And I was like, all right, we'll, I'll, we'll sit for like a minute, you know, and just quiet. We were like six seconds in, and my, the middle child is like, are, are we are we still doing this? And like, <laughs> okay, maybe we'll do ten seconds to start. We're gonna increase it a little bit that's as we true. go. But like that's the starting point. Like start. it doesn't have to be perfect. It has yeah. to. Just, but something's got to happen. Yeah. I got to do be intentional, like I said. So you keep moving. That's right. Um, you all have a, a great ministry oriented to family. So you're not just personally interested in this, but you you have devoted a lot of time and energy and created a ministry around this. To talk about what that ministry is and how it functions. Uh, Trinity House Community that Ever and I co-direct is uh, devoted to the mission of inspiring families to make home a little taste of heaven for the renewal of faith and culture. And we really uh, carry this out in three ways. The first way is um, engaging the community. Uh, Seven years ago, we opened a cafe in the heart of Leesburg called Trinity House Cafe and Market. Mm -hmm. And that's where we engage them with a beautiful image of essentially the Christian home in public. It's built, it's in an old um, 1800s home. You step in and you feel like you're in a living room and a family room. Uh, So that's the engaging part. Then we equip parents uh, in their sacred duty as uh, primary educators with our workshops. We have a Heaven in Your Home workshop and our weekly e-letter, which provides kind of a jolt of inspiration and practical tools for the types of things we've been talking about here, family prayer, dinner. Yeah. And then uh, we engage, uh, we encourage parents then uh, through our Heaven in Your Home gatherings, which is a monthly, um, just fun time together as families at our parish in Leesburg. Uh, and that's really built around uh, couples can come and bring their kids and um, we don't have a lecture. We, we call it a conversation starter, <laughs> which, which we then discuss at tables, and the kids are just having a blast. So really kind of looking at that engaging, equipping, and encouraging the family today. Yeah, you all have a very beautiful ministry, and I know a lot of people get, you know, get involved and benefited from it. Where can, if someone wants to look it up, where to, what's the website? So it's trinityhousecommunity.org. All right, keeping it yeah. simple. That's great. Yeah. Um, if there's a, a, a person listening, a, you know, a parent or a spouse or someone who's trying to, 
they're they're struggling with the complexity of the world. They're dealing with all these you know challenges, these kind of external challenges, and feeling like they're being bombarded. What would just you, you know? What would be your encouragement or consolation for them as they try to you know get their family on track and raise them as, as good Catholics? Sort of the central tenet of the Trinity House community life. We we talk about building your own Trinity House, and this is a, a home in which the family lives together in interpersonal communion, like the persons of the Trinity. And we always talk about heaven in your home, which is also kind of a joke because none of us actually has that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, but the thing that I would say to encourage those parents is. We don't have to do this for ourselves. Jesus already achieved this victory for us. He gave us heaven in our homes. All we have to do is go and bring that life of the Trinity. Go go take communion. Bring the Eucharist into your heart, and you will have the life of the Trinity. And then you can bring it home and pass it on to your spouse and children. So it's not something that you have to do. All you have to do is know that your God is all-powerful and that he did all of this for us already. So take advantage of what God has given us and stop worrying and trust him and go and get the Eucharist and bring the life of the Trinity into your family and you can have heaven in your home. And of course, um, human nature will trip us up and uh, we'll, we'll go up and down. But the, the main thing is... Um, trust God. He, he is all-knowing, all-powerful. He has your back. He's done all of the work for you. So yeah, don't worry. And, and, and don't be afraid of our culture. It has nothing on him. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we, we have God. What are we worried about? We should be joyful. We should be excited. We should be passionate. We should be out there just um, excitedly saying, look what God did for us. He, he saved us from all of this. No, no, no. Don't spend your time thinking about all that bad stuff. It isn't even real. If, if you if we spend our time as JP two did on um, just focusing on the goodness of God and everything that He's done for us, for the human family and for our individual families, all of this um, bad stuff that we spend so much time worrying about how it's oppressing us will will dissipate, and we can just take hold of the salvation that has already been given to our families. So. Mm. Trust Very and uh, take hold of it. That was good. <laughs> All right. You're not going to try no, to top no, that, are you, no way. <laughs> no way. No. Just, just listen to that right there. <laughs> just rewind it and play it That's one more right. time. That's <laughs> right. Very good. Well, Ever Soren, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And again, it's trinitydousecommunity.org. You, said? you got it. All right. Very good. Thank you so Thanks, much for joining Bill. me. Thank you, Billy. Really appreciate your having us. Awesome. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.